Hello everyone who's listening. Uh, my name is Colleen Friend and I'm on the board of the California Social Welfare Archives. And today we are in Pasadena, California, and we are interviewing Jane Kurahara, who is going to speak to us about her wealth of experience in working in the field of social work and also specifically her experience in California, both as a practitioner and on the field faculty of the UCLA School of Social Welfare. So welcome, Jane. Thank you for having both myself and David Kurahara at, excuse me, I thank you for welcoming myself and David Kuroda to your home. So he is uh, doing all the things, technical assistance, and also has participated in the preparation for this interview. So thank you for having us. So with that, Jane, we usually have an opening question about saying, you know, you've had You've gone to George Warren Brown School of Social Work, which is a very prestigious school of social work. And then I looked at your resume and you have a wealth of experience around the country in Hawaii, in Rochester, and working in East Los Angeles and various other places. And so we usually open it up by saying to the interviewee, we appreciate your wealth of experience and could mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about sort of the themes that unite your experience and what you make of all of it and the times that you practiced social okay. work. Okay. You know, I, I wanted to start by telling a little bit about who I was and where I started from okay. because I did not start in social work profession by living through some of the areas where we serve people and type of uh, life experience that bring. I brought to the field a very good family background, a lot of energy, and I was one considered a green pea. I mean, Rochelle Doffman used to laugh at me but when I used the term green pea, meaning that I came straight from college into the profession. Yeah. I was a music major, hoping to be a piano teacher, but then um, found out that I could not deal with teaching off we go to music land and so I thought I should change my major into soci psych and then I had a mentor who was a MSW way back in in the uh, 50, 40s who really uh, was um, had gone to Simmons School of Social Work in Boston mm -hmm. and she told me a little bit about the film and I thought God, she's such a gracious lady and uh, loved her serving, liked to be with people and so that was my impetus of really admiring someone and saying yes that's a field that I might like because I did a lot of volunteer during my college year at Y team programs and I was good as a leader and I, and I could sing and get the young people together and I said oh, this is what I would like to do and so I was really, as Rochelle Doffman uses my term, green pea, and I applied to the School of Social Work. And so I applied to University of Hawaii and I think about three other schools in the Midwest because at that time, it was in the 50s and I felt that a lot of people from Hawaii went to school in the Midwest because they said people in the Midwest are much more accommodating of students from Hawaii. At that time, Hawaii was still a territory when I left Hawaii. And so that's why I chose, and I chose University of Missouri and Washington U. And my mother somehow had found out that Washington University had a better school of social work. And my mother is not a college grad, but somehow she had heard from friends that if Jane is going to school in St. Louis, uh, to Missouri, go to George Warren Brown. And that's why I s went straight to George Warren Brown School of Social Work wow. and uh, did my two years there. And from there, I graduated. I went back to Hawaii and worked a year. And being a good Asian woman, I promised my parents that uh, I will fulfill one wish of their thing for funding all my education and my dad said my one request Jane and is that you spend at least one year after graduation from us we'll be we'll 
were so proud that you had gone on and finished graduate school. So I really did not want to leave St. Louis because I had a boyfriend and was, in a, was engaged. And, but I did go home and I worked for the Bureau of Vital uh, uh, Site Conservation. Mm -hmm. It was still the territory. It was called the territory. And it was working with children, with babies, with retrolental fibroplasias. What happened is during, during the war time, when the preemies were born, they were put in incubators and they became blind. And so this was the only period when they discovered that the excessive oxygen were making babies blind. My goodness that they stop using uh, the incubator as much. But in the meantime, we had about 40, 50 babies who were now three, four, five years old who really needed help. And so because I had an MSW, I was selected to offer casework services to parents feeling guilty about having children that became blind. And, helped them with, and all my clinical skills became very helpful at that time. And so I did, and because this was such a special group of children, the doctors were very interested in seeing these children. So then I also gave lectures of how I was working with these blind children, their families, to doctors at Triple General Hospital and Queens Hospital. And so for my first position, it was an exciting time for me. And I really enjoyed, and I would take these blind children to give the parents some time away. So once a week, I would take maybe three or four of them. Can you imagine, right out of graduate school, taking three or four to go, take them to the mall, shopping, or looking at animals and or go to the aquariums just describing things and I would take a case aid with me. And so it was a very, very satisfying. And at that time, we had two children who were, uh, one child was a musical prodigy. He was, she was completely blind, but her parents were musicians. And so another MSW and I would, take them together and they would play the piano. And then one gal who was about four also loved singing. And so we encouraged her to sing. And those are the days of David Crockett, uh, uh, on the mountain top lived, you know, David Crockett. Oh. And she would sing and then she would sing and get on the chair and say, whatever, Lola wants. Lola gets, you remember those songs? <laughs> yes, I do. And yes. it was the most happiest time for me to be in the field, to be with these children, and to work with parents. Sure. And so those were my first year experience, but then I moved back to St. Louis. Okay. So then from moving back to St. Louis, we also wanted to ask you about practicing social work in the time of the 60s and the 70s. So could you fast forward a little bit and tell us a little bit what practicing social work was like in those okay. tumultuous times? Uh, let me take you back in the 50s. Okay. Because uh, you know I graduated in 1954, okay. and uh, so this is on for 55. When I was trained at, UC, uh, at George Warren Brown, we were trained as clinicians, and the school was very, very strict about who we were, and we have to use ourself in all our clinical work. So the, our, we, there were two schools of two thoughts of social work. You either were a diagnostic school social worker, which was Freud and in base. And so our psychopathology human growth was taught by a psychiatrist and took mm -hmm. us all the way from oral needs all the way up to adolescence. And so it was a very clinical program. Okay. And, if, and they said that when you graduate from school, you have to be supervised for three to five years by clinical social workers, uh, MSW. And so if you move to Philadelphia, they wouldn't hire you because uh, the other school was called the functional school of social work. 
and it was auto rank. Oh. See, I, that's why I'm, oh, what George okay. Warren Brown trained us real well. And at that time, we also had state hospitals. And so we, I, for our psychopathology, we went to the uh, St. Louis State Hospital. And we walked through the um, hospital to get all into the lecture hall. Uh -huh. And at that time, the psychiatrist will bring, say, tonight, today we're going to cover a catatonic patient. And we'd usher this catatonic patient and uh, say, okay, now put your arm there. And, you know, some of the things, and would ask questions and s then would review all the symptoms of oh the thing. And then we had to walk through the wards to get to the auditorium. And I remember one Sunday, Saturday, it was Saturday morning class. We got there late, so three of us caught our bus was a little late. So we got there about 10 minutes late. So we had to go to lock wards. Those days it was lock wards. And when we, the, at that time social work had terrible uh, description of people. Moral, imbecile, mm -hmm. you remember? Mm -hmm. It was way back then. And so we had to walk through all the different levels of uh, patient. And then when we got to the stages where there were more people who were convalescent, we had to walk through that ward to get to the auditorium. And we tried to be as brave and so, but we were kind of scared because, you know, mm -hmm. we're young and, sure. yeah. And we were walking, a man came out to us and said, Boo! and all three of us jumped up and says, I knew you were trying to be calm and try to be professional, but I wanted to see you all jump up and have fun. <laughs> and he laughed and that, and that sort of broke the ice and it was kind of fun. The, the, you know, many things that I could recall about my education at George Warren Brown, it really had a lot of nice things to go. And then we also had uh, group work. Everyone had to go to the settlement houses mm. and we had to go at night. And at that time, Elvis Presley first came out and oh. a hound dog. And, uh -huh. and here I came from Hawaii and I was with a Tommy Dossie and the Big Bear and Arrow people. And uh, that was my music. Then I get into the settlement house and they're playing the guitar and they're dancing and rock and you know, the rock time was coming up. So in some ways, uh -huh. I really had a nice education. It was a really nice time. But at the same time, St. Louis was on the Mason-Dixon line. Oh, tell us about that. And it, yes. And so it was coming from Hawaii, it really was a really cultural shock for me to be in, I had never seen slums before, never seen ghettos before. I mean, we have uh, poor areas in Hawaii. I'm not saying that we did not have people in Hawaii. We had that, but to come to a city, and here I thought I was coming to St. Louis, and I was little music where it kept running through my mind, meet me in St. Louis, and clang clang was a trolley, and I was really looking forward to going to St. Louis, and right then and there, cultural shock. Mm -hmm. Then we stayed at the Y for two nights, because we were graduate students, and uh, there were no dormitory spaces. And then someone tried to break into our room that uh, first night we were there. And I tell you, I was a basket case when <laughs> I said I made a mistake. But my dad had told me since I was a green pea going off to school, at any time if you feel she said, you're going to learn a lot of things about your profession. It's working with poor people, too. And he says, not only just advising people. My dad was a pretty, uh, he was a second generation person. And so there's a lot of communication in my family. And uh, that's why I'm a little bit on the more talkative side and aggressive and all that. So he told me that you, you know, you'll be learning new things. And I, 
his ideas really floated to my head as I said yes. And he said, anytime you feel you can't handle this, you're welcome home. Come home, this is an airplane flight, I gave you a check, and in case you don't like it, you can come on home. I mean, but I was a green pea at that uh -huh. time. But then I had a lot of support from my family as I went to graduate school. I said, no, this is my challenge. Mm. And so, uh, and then at the, we were the second class that uh, admitted African Americans. Oh my. All other schools had no African Americans, no minorities. They, but they had Hawaii students, quite a few, because uh, we were somehow our doctors and our architects were social, uh, and, and also. Uh, they accepted Hawaii students, but we were considered foreigners because you remember I you were left there. It was a territory, so we were treated like foreign students. So you can imagine, uh, the people were very nice, and we were the only thing for the being Asian American that we were not allowed in the swimming pools, and uh, we were allowed in restaurants. But some of our African American classmates, we couldn't go out to eat around the school because it was off limits. And the big hospital, the African Americans were in the basement, not wow. in the real hospital. And if they had an African American hospital called Homer G. Phillips. And so I learned a lot at that time and I was exposed very quickly as to minorities and places. Uh, and oh, and one other thing is that Asians could not intermarry. Oh. And so that was one, but they, we were accepted as whites, but we were foreigners. And uh, it, so for me, I, it was a new experience to be a foreigner, you know, because in Hawaii I grew up with more majority experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's why I felt that I grew up as a majority and all sure. of a sudden I've become a minority. Wow. And so that was a transition that um, that played and made me stronger, I think. And I I my theory is my philosophy is learn what you can and grow with each experience. Mm -hmm. And this is why my 80 five years of life has been very uh, happy and grow and I, you know, we have little things that happen, but this first few years of experience in St. Louis, really, I grew up. I really, uh, my first year placement was with the Department of Public Social Services mm -hmm. and I would go out on home visits. We used to go out home visits a lot to see our patients and we, I walked, would go into um, places that look like Watts and really look for my clients and really grew up in, in St. Louis. I really uh, grew up as a, a stronger person and really began lo learning the feel as it is. You know, I, I think I had a romantic view of what social worker was, but reality hit me and I really began enjoying working with people felt that I really cared about them and I enjoyed even going into the poverty stricken area and just didn't feel afraid. I was really, and my patients were so, and I had a lot of African American patients. Mm -hmm. And so that was a very good experience. Then my second year I was placed at the hospital. And so I grew a lot at the Which hospital. Which hospital were you placed at? At Los. the medical center. Okay, all right at Washington University Medical Center. Okay. And it was a big department of about 35, 40 social workers. And so we were highly trained. We were supervised every week. And we really need to see where we're coming from, use of self. And Washington U was very good. And I felt I had really a strong underpinning as a clinical social worker. 
Wow, well, that's very impressive. And I wonder if this might be a good place to segue into, you know, coming from a majority position into a place where you were a minority. You know, I wonder if that also had an influence on later on when you went to UCLA yes. and how you worked at UCLA to try to open up that school of social welfare for other kinds of students, especially Asian Americans. Would that be a good time to talk about this now? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Tell well, us about that though, but maybe just, just going back a little uh, further, because things were beginning to change okay. in, the, uh, in the late 50s and 60s when I moved to Rochester. Okay, tell we, us about that. Okay, when we moved to Rochester, I was pregnant, and so, uh, but the department took me on as a part-time social worker because of my great, uh, University of Rochester, the medical school had a very psychi strong psychiatric department. And Dr. Romano felt that all doctors should learn how to relate to patients. So instead of learning just pathology and, and, and all the scientific thing, from the day one that the medical student got into University of Rochester, they were exposed to people. Mm -hmm. And he was a strong. He was a strong component of the medical teaching there. So they had a position that they wanted the uh, medical students to learn how to use social workers with a psychiatrist. And it was a part-time job because it was only in the morning. Oh. And so it was perfect for me as a new mother. Uh -huh. I could find a babysitter and work in the morning at the senior teaching clinic. So all of a sudden, I became a teacher with the psychiatrist. And what, mm -hmm. what I did was, when the students worked in the senior clinic, they might have a patient that didn't have money for uh, their medicine. So they would then refer, start with uh, saying, okay, you need to see a social worker. So the psychiatrist and I would sit down with the medical student and the medical student was to observe me, interview a, a, a client. And of course, you know that not having the money for the medicine is just a tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And as social workers, we're trained to get a very good history because we learn to listen. And the psychiatrists say, watch her interview the clients and see how she can get from the tip of the iceberg and we get a round picture of, of who the patient is. Mm -hmm. And so that was my position and I really enjoyed it. And after the patient left, I would help the patient uh, the referral source to places where they could go for medication and, and help them with the thing. And, talk to them about their illness and how they're doing about their illness. I mean, going beyond the medicine, but seeing how they're coping with and seeing what their life stresses were and got a real round picture. And so that's what the psychiatrist wanted them to begin to learn how to approach people, mm -hmm. not to just get a diagnosis and treat it, but to really get to know you and establish contact. And that, so that was my major role for my uh, two years, that two and a half years that I worked in the medical teaching clinic. Great. Yes, and then after that, I worked in the psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what interesting thing, I, of course I had two, two children. I had three children in four years and so, uh, but I did work part-time because my husband was a resident physician mm -hmm. and we were getting 200 a month and our rent was $80. Oh my so goodness. I worked I worked in a psychiatric hospital and it was a place where you worked as a team because it was a receiving hospital for someone who first became diagnosed with illness and I'm supposed to take a history. By that time I was an expert in history taking. And then I would bring, interview the uh, families. I would 
be the source where the family brings all the history and then sit with the team and come up with the different history and the diagnosis and then send them on after two weeks to the proper uh, long-term care or medication or patient services. So that was a very interesting time and it was a time when things were really changing too. The Sputnik went up and so the joke around the thing, the, the other people would come to our team and say, how are your psychonauts doing? You know, and there was a lot of happiness and nice work done as a team. And I job shared my position, which mm. was very interesting. Wow. There was a woman who worked with Dr. Romano who wanted to go into private practice of social work and because some of the psychiatrists felt that they need social workers to to go in private practice and so Iris, Iris Bennett wanted to work three days a week and she wanted me to cover two days so two days a week with three children was perfect for me and so I job shared and at that time um, the pill, contraceptive pills came out. Oh my goodness. And yes. they were free for all, families were, for, they were wife swap, swapping, you know, there were all these things that were happening at that time in the late 50s and 60s, the, all the years I lived in Rochester. It was an interesting time. And Rochester was known at the end of the um, railroad, you know, underground railroad. Oh. And so they, mm -hmm. if you saw the, I learned a lot about the black history, uh, working with black people and found out that the uh, Underground Railroad ended around in Rochester. And so that's where Rochester had a bourgeois black community. That's where some of the deans of Howard uh, University, some instructors of the, uh, African uh, American colleges, mm -hmm. a lot of the educators were families from Rochester. Fascinating. Yes, wow. and so I had a chance to meet these women because they wanted me to review the book Hawaii that Michener wrote. I see. And so I got to meet them and was able to see how some of the most successful African Americans were had come into place and how they became leaders and educators in the field. So it was a very interesting growth for me mm -hmm. to learn about minorities uh, and then coming to um, Los Angeles found out about the Latino movement too. Yes. Okay. So why don't you tell us about coming to Los Angeles because you've taken us through George Warren Brown and your history after that, and also you've taken us through a little bit of the 60s, the 50s and the 60s. Okay. So now are you in Los Angeles in the 70s? In the late 60s. Okay. okay, tell us about that. When we first moved here, I had a friend from uh, San Diego whose brother lived here, and she said, oh, why don't you get to meet David, and he can maybe introduce you to young people. So David called me and said, oh yes, Jane, uh, next week, there's going to be a meeting, a social action meeting in our neighborhood in Pasadena. And it's going to be the, the Japanese Americans were sent to con, you know, concentration mm -hmm. camps. And so they're trying to repeal this title too and try to um, publicize what was done to the Japanese American. And there's now a chairperson named Bob Suzuki, who's going to give us speak on his work. And so, would you like to go? And so I said, yes, I'd like to go. So I did go, and that's when I met a lot of the Japanese American here who were there mm -hmm. to kind of promote this thing. And from this offshoot, they said, we have a group of, quote, social workers who wants to do some social action. I said, my God, what a wonderful opportunity. And so that's when I joined um, the um, uh, group of people. They were not an organization, a group of people who wanted to really try to do some social action to make people aware yes. of 
the Japanese American community. So I thought that was very good. And I, at that time, was working part time, two days, or three days a week, at East LA uh, Clinic, was, which was in Boyle Heights, not Boyle Heights, but in um, Lincoln Heights. Okay. And so that's when I uh, worked part time, and I was getting to know the Latino community, and I was pretty excited about really working with that group of minor and worked mostly with children, worked with children with emotional problems, bedwetting problems, although they came to the clinic to get medical problem, medical help, but there were a lot of emotional help. Mm -hmm. So that's when I, I, and I loved that position. It was wonderful learning to work with Latino families. And so, but I then got involved with this group of people who were wanted to do some social action. So we had a couple of meetings and they said, we don't have enough social workers in uh, Asian social workers. And it's very difficult to get into UCLA because if you look, they said we need to, and the, the African American students and Chicano students I heard are trying to really activate the school and really making a lot of noise in the school. So we need to get in there. And so we decided, yes, we need to try to do something about that. I was very excited. And so I think four or five of us decided we'll go to UCLA and we'll uh, share with, uh, we'll confront that there's need in our community because we don't even have social work agencies in our community. Mm -hmm. But we need social workers to begin to develop our community uh, with social agencies. And so four, five of us, I think, one. In fact, there were, I keep forgetting the number, but it's significant because one person did, wa did not want to go to confront us. Okay because he felt he was on the field faculty. He was a field instructor. He was one, a field instructor for UCLA, and he just did not feel quite comfortable going to school. Okay. And so four of us were all MSWs, but we went there, and uh, that morning we, we, we had our meeting. We went to the dean's office, and he had Harry Kitano. Mm -hmm. He brought Harry Kitano to sit next to him. And Harry, being Harry, sat down and being nice and polite, sat next to Nathan Cohen. Nathan okay. Cohen was the dean. And we presented our issues and we said that we, we really need to push for more social workers because the Asian community, uh, we do have problems. You know, we're not out there saying we have the problem, but we have lots of marital problem, family problems, and we really need some training for people who understand the culture. And knowing the language is just like I know in the Latino community, they, they say, well, we need uh, Spanish-speaking social workers. And, but I think beside language, you, should, you have to be aware of the culture. Mm -hmm. If you can't help mm -hmm. people if you're not aware of the culture, just learn to speak the language. But in the Japanese community, it's reversed, because being a third generation, as old as I am, I'm a sansei. But we spoke Japanese to our grandparents. We went to language school until about the elementary school. So our language capacity was zilch. In terms, during the war, we were, they had Tojo, Mussolini, and Hitler, and they put a mark on each face and say, do not speak the en enemy language. So mm. that's where my language capacity stopped, right? you know, as far as being in elementary school. So I could converse to understand what's been said, but I can't read or write mm -hmm. as well in Japanese. And so um, that's the kind of background I was bringing in to the field of social work as a Japanese American. And, uh, but anyway, so after that meeting. Yes, come back to the meeting and tell us yes. how Harry Katano and yes. uh, Dean Cohen responded so to you. So they asked us, uh, 
I said that we know that student you had even rejected some of our five at a campus from Berkeley that couldn't get into your school. Uh, what is it that you're not accepting Asian students? And uh, they said, well, you know, they didn't apply. We said, no, I, we know that they applied and they just got rejected. And uh, uh, Nathan Coyne just didn't give us real good answers. So we were kind of hostile and say, you just don't understand when you get rejected because you may have a good GPA, but maybe they want, in those days, social workers should be articulate and be able to talk a lot more. And Asians are never pride themselves about uh, being quiet. It's a virtue of a Japanese woman learn to be quiet, not to be chatterbox like I am, you know. So uh, usually Japanese Americans at least mm. were very quiet and unless they have something to offer, they never o raised their hands. And so I'm sure this was reflected in the letters of references and all this. And he didn't want to hear all that. And he, he was very, uh, you could see on his face, he was very upset and, you know, like, how dare you come to our school to do that? And I knew, I, I sensed a lot of anger coming out of him. And um, so we left that day. And the next morning, he resigned. He, re he resigned from the School of Social Work. And Dean Connery, then Dean Maurice Connery became the dean. Oh my goodness. And they said, wow, what powerful people you are, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> you, you all of them you just got him so upset that he resigned. And I said, can you imagine us being hostile and angry? And I said, maybe we were, because we were fighting for a cause, for a purpose. And that's why we went there. We weren't there to, to to be kind and nice, and we were there to be mm -hmm. confrontive. And mm -hmm. I guess in all of our behavior, we showed him that we were very confrontive. And um, so at that time, the, we had to work through, uh, we told Harry at that time that we would like to have a fair share in, in the incoming class. And so the, uh, the students were activists that they were, uh, Jonan was one of the students at that time in, in, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, social work school. Mm -hmm. So that class really came out and said, we want the school to reflect some of our population. So the formula was 30, 30, 30, 10. 30% white, 30% black, 30% Hispanic, and 10% Asian. And how did they come up with that formula? Was that reflective of the population of it LA really at that time? It really didn't reflect it all the way, but they said, we have to catch up. Okay. We have to, have to catch up. And at that time, the African-American population was big, the Chicano, and the Asian population, because they had, slowly they were coming back from camps. Yes. And uh, uh, now, today, it's very different because you have new immigrants from China, and. Indonesia and you know Thailand, you have all that population now. But those days, it was 30, 30, 30, 30, 10. My goodness. And so that really, st and so of the 75 students, we were allowed seven students, six to seven Asian students. And that's the group that came in in class of 69, 70, 70, class of 71. Class of 70, seven Asian American students. Yes. Now, how did you start working there? It sounds okay. like this is all related. Yeah, well, I was a field instructor for uh, UCLA. Okay. And Winfred Smith somehow took a liking to me, and uh, uh, she, she was very uh, instrumental after I was there for, uh, I think, at um, East LA Clinic for two or three years. So she invited me to join faculty mm. and uh, wanted me to uh, work with the Asian students. But I was working, 
uh, with the students. Somehow I got to know the minority students and when the first class came in, I worked with the students also from the very first affirmative action class students. My students of the 70s were really motivated, active, and very delightful students. And I still am in contact with some of these students yet, but they were really ready for social action. But the climate also at UCLA was time of Angela Davis. A lot of student uh, unrest on campus. Mm -hmm. They would march to uh, Westwood and the National Guards were out with their guns, not facing, facing this way, facing the students. I mean, I was there too, so I know what it was like. It mm -hmm. was very tense for time. It was not, it was an exciting time, but tense for time because of the marches to UCLA. And, but anyway, so Winifred Smith invited me to joined the uh, fieldwork faculty. And part of my position was that since we had said that there's no Japanese, uh, no Asian agencies out there, they had agreed to, for me to take a group of students to the Japanese hospital. At that time, the history is that Japanese uh, uh, doctors were not allowed to work in the regular hospitals. So they mm -hmm. had to build their own hospital in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. So we have a Japanese hospital. And they built a Japanese, nice Berenju. And they wanted me to take, so Winifred Smith asked me if I would negotiate with the hospital to bring a group of students in to introduce them to the services of social work. And so that was a very challenging experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I took three, four students and they, the, the um, hospital and the staff began to learn about the use of social workers. And also they, at that time, they just opened the first gerontology nursing home. Mm. And so the, it was a exciting time, and so the students were able to work to get history for the intake of families that were placing uh, student, uh, families into. So, and then also there was a psychiatrist, no, a general practitioner who really wanted to be a psychiatrist. So he took a lot of the uh, patients that had psychosomatic illnesses and psychiatric patients. And so he became very close friends with me, and so he allowed my students to have long-term patients. For some, Great. he felt that uh, he didn't know any social workers, and he found out I was an MSW, so he had my students take some of, he said, would you like, those that we didn't think about, lawsuits and things, uh -huh. but he asked me if he could refer some of my uh, couple or three of his patients for my students for long-term care, you know, some with psychosomatic illnesses and uh, some that he was giving uh, drugs, uh, antidepressants and things. That was the beginning of the antidepressant drugs and things. So he said mm. he would like to have my students monitor them. So my students had an op opportunity to have long-term patients and do clinical social work. So it was an exciting oh, time. It was great, I mean, that they were able to do this in their field work. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I made good use of my field work experience. And then they put me on the admissions committee. Okay, so right now you're on the faculty. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, as okay. soon as I joined, in fact, oh, no, at, because I was a field instructor, from the, from the 70s, from the first class, they asked me to look over some of their applicants. Okay, I see, okay, uh, go ahead. Yes, so Tell I did that, that as a field instructor. Okay. That was very interesting that mm -hmm. they had allowed me to do that. And then from that on, period on, when I joined the faculty, I was on the admissions committee. And I was on the admissions committee 
until I forever. Retire. Forever. <laughs> yes, yes. And then in the early part, uh -huh. they the school also uh, the dean uh, Maurice Connery uh, was very supportive of what I did. You know, uh -huh. he was very supportive with Winifred Smith, my opening that unit at the Japanese hospital, mm -hmm. and also asking me to do recruitment and go to, so he, I used to go to all the different universities up north to Berkeley, um, um, Stanford. Uh, I traveled with a consortium of minority uh, recruiters from okay. the total universities, you know, from SC, UCLA, from Southern California, and we used to do the rounds of these, uh, the colleges to move students into our program. Oh, so to recruit people on the bachelor's level to come yes, into the Yes, on the bachelor's program. level. Oh, wow. So, I, I, uh, so they gave me time, besides my field work, gave mm -hmm. me time to go with the uh, recruitment. So then tell us about that. I imagine your recruitment efforts yielded yeah. a few uh, shining star students. Yeah. And then also the dean also let me take students sometimes. Okay. So I was able to take UCLA students with me mm -hmm. to uh, several uh, when they could take some time off. He even he paid for their plane ticket and uh, room because we had to stay in places. And I got to know some of my uh, Hispanic students and Asian students, but the African American students uh, went with the African American. I don't know. They went locally, but I did the whole minority thing for UCLA, uh, for the Northern California. Well, this and is quite an impressive achievement, Jane. I mean, you went from uh, confronting uh, Dean Cohen to having you know, him resign and then you're going out and you're establishing this sort of student unit at a Japanese hospital and, and then you're actually involved with admissions yes. and recruiting in Northern California. So tell us more about your recruitment efforts and what did that yield and what did that bring to UCLA? Oh, of course, everybody, were, you know, lots of students were excited about the possibility of getting into UCLA because yes. UCLA was known as really a top school and also SC. As you know, SC was a lot more clinical school than our school was, being trained as a, but so the, sometimes the recruited person from USC would sit down with me too. And the, so we worked together, okay. you know, it was nothing. And also even with the students too, I'll tell you later how I worked with Asian students together. but. Yes, so the school was very supportive. I have to say that UCLA was supportive of, of me uh, in doing this. And, but also at the same time, you know, some of the faculty weren't too happy about all this minority movement and all this kind of thing. And, you know, you can tell from little subtle comments and things. And, uh, and also, they weren't too happy with the 30, 30, 30, 90. I, you know, I don't want to say names and things, but you, you could feel like comments, mm -hmm. you know. How did you deal with that? Because I'm thinking some uh, future students are going to be viewing this tape, and what advice would you have for them well, for dealing with things like that? What I did was, that's where my Asian-ness came in. But okay, they, they have about that. They have things called gamang. You know, gamang means to hold back and not to just blurt out everything, to hold back, because there'll be about time when the appropriate time. Uh, but it, it's, that's why when the Japanese were sent to concentration camp, they said, gamang, you have to take what's coming, and you, you know, but that's a strong word in Japanese, and so even in the third generation, I, I knew what that was, and so, I, as, as assertive and as chatty as I am, I know how to gum on too. Okay. I know how to hold back and so, and because I really felt the time will come, you know, uh, it, no, it's no sense of being confronted to everything, you know, there be sometimes you have to tamper that. And uh, I learned how to tamper that. 
but if for someone is outright racism, racist, uh, then I would confront whatever um, racism that I met. Because I know that two years when my husband was in the service, uh, he w we were sent to the uh, San Diego Naval Hospital. And I met a lot of racism there. And, mm -hmm. and I know what racism is. And there's, there's some times where you can deal with racism. Like one time I went to the um, uh, Miramar Air Base to do my shopping. And then, of course, that's what the time when a lot of uh, soldiers were bringing war brides back from Japan and, you know. And so when they see someone like me, immediately, you know, you can feel like, well, I'm not going to wait on you or that kind of thing. But being grown up with a major m mentality, I'm not going to take that. And I would say, but I was here before her. You know, because I, I said, now wait a minute, I, it's my turn, I'm, I'm in mine. And, uh, and then they know from my tone, tone of voice, it was with speaking with authority, you know, I didn't was hostile, I just say, it's my turn in that voice of term. And then they reluctantly would wait. They had a lot of racism in the uh, Navy. And when they see my identification, it says Lieutenant Commander. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You know, they changed the whole scenario because of my husband's title, or just a paper. And, and, and then when we went to even, um, it, it really, the war was over just a few years, so there was a lot of hostility. But I dealt with what I thought I could deal with. Mm -hmm. and, and if someone, just, because I really had a ma majority mentality, and I think that's the thing that I was so grateful, that I had grown up mm -hmm. to be such a strong person. Because mm -hmm. um, it permeated my whole life. It wasn't only with racism, but it just made me a stronger person because I felt very grounded as a majority. I'm glad that you're explaining that because I think the people that are viewing this tape will have a better sense of where you were coming from when you, uh, when all these things were going on at UCLA. But if I can direct you back to go back to the UCLA School of Social Welfare yeah. at that time, yeah, tell us about your recruitment efforts and your work on the admissions committee. Yeah, but just, just one little step sure. back. Harry Kitano used to say, you are my pineapple, you know, mm -hmm. and what he meant pineapple is I was a Hawaiian. He said that the Hawaiians come back with a strong self and confidence because they grew up with a big group of people. You know, a lot of the minority, uh, the Asian Americans were minorities. Mm -hmm. And I really had a majority mentality. And that's why he called me favoritely. And he, were, he and I were very close he, because he, he was such a well-known person, and he had so much statue at U sure. UCLA that he, he really, there were things that he couldn't do that I could do, <laughs> huh. you know, as a, as a poor man, and also the fact that I was very strong and I pushed for things, and he liked that. So he and I were very, very close. Uh, we worked as a team, mm -hmm. and so he, even when we, had things to do with the students, the Asian students, he always participated with that's me. That's great, Jane. Yeah, so that's I just amazing. wanted to interject No, that. that's very important. We, we should honor Harry Catano and his very important work yeah. and his, all, his, all his writings. Uh -huh. Very impressive, yes. So tell us about, uh, we wanted to get to, you know, bringing more Asian American students into UCLA, which of course um, some other Asian American practitioners think that perhaps your pioneering efforts at UCLA had a lot to do with perhaps them coming on to different schools of social work in the Los Angeles area. So we'd like to talk to you about you know your pioneering work in that area and also about um, you know what it was like to find field placements for Asian American students. Yeah, well for the students, uh, we my philosophy is get them into the system get into 
train these people so they can then uh, do work in their agencies and things. Mm -hmm. And so, because um, there weren't that many Asian uh, agencies. And so, but then they also, there was a agency called SSG, Special Services for Group, and mm -hmm. it really started by George Nishinaka. But that group, or that agency was very helpful in that they, they funded a lot of things and they funded uh, the Asian American Mental Health Training Center and they got, gave us stipends uh, for the students. Mm -hmm. And they also um, had different seminars and things. But SSG helped the Asian community a lot and they really uh, um, help bring up uh, a lot of social workers, you know, oh, because yes. it, it, uh, George Nishinaka did a lot of great jobs for, uh, he, he graduated, he graduated in 55. I was looking at some of the history of social work and he was one year after me, but he was a veteran. So that's mm -hmm. why I think he went to uh, USC. USC had a lot more social workers in their alumni before the movement. Okay. Not that many, but they had, was UCLA had maybe six, seven before the big affirmative action. Are you we talking didn't. about six or seven Asian American students? Yeah. There, is that what you're yeah. talking about? Okay. Yeah. The, Great. There was so few, but, but SC had a lot more than UCLA. So you had people that graduated in the 50s, sprinkling, but they had students in the 60s also. Okay, and so out of the special services for group came quite a few prominent Asian American practitioners. Yes. That we know now that that's part of their background and their history. Yes, and then, uh, you know, one of our graduates for second class, Bill Watanabe, went to uh, the community were very active at that time, so they had some funding money from an orphanage, uh, you know, because uh, in the 1920s they had orphans, and so mm -hmm. this Japanese man uh, had an orphanage for the Japanese, and so during the war he took all the orphans to the camp, but by that time the camp, the, the orphans were already in middle school and junior high so then so there was no need for an orphanage after the war so okay. they had a little seed money and so with that seed money they started little tokyo service center and the person uh, who became the head was a graduate of our program bill watanabe and he made it into a very big organization mm -hmm. but one other area at that time was mostly Japanese and Chinese and Koreans. Koreans were a little later, but the Chinese, we had a student in Bill Watanabe's class named Dick Wong. And Dick Wong was in the macro, like uh, Bill Watanabe. And they had grant writing oh. in, uh, in UCLA. Mm -hmm. And so Dick was a former minister, Methodist minister. And so he came into our program. He went to Boston before that in a master's degree in counseling. But then he found out that MSW was a better degree and he can do a lot more with it. So he came to our school. So at, when he wrote, he was in this um, uh, grant writing class with Alex Norman. Mm -hmm. uh, remember yes. Alex? Yes. He, he, he wrote this thing up and Alex said, why don't you see if you could get this funded? He said, oh yeah, I know somebody who was interested in doing these things. So he wrote, sent this proposal of his, from his grant writing and sent it to the Methodist uh, organization, the headquarters, and they gave him a seed money to start the Chinatown Social Service. Well, so was a student from a grant from wow. our school that got uh, 
the seed money to start this, uh, Chinatown Social Service. And they hired someone from the town who worked with the social service sort of loosely for two years. And then one of our graduates, Irene Chu, mm -hmm. got in the, and made it into a super organization. So the Chinatown Social Service is a huge organization, like a little Tokyo Service Center. Great. So, you know, that's, and I, I'm diverting a little, but the Korean community was beginning to come in because mm -hmm. they were getting a lot of new immigrants into, and then our students were interested in uh, helping the Korean movement. We didn't have that many students, but it's amazing, but a Chinese, uh, Japanese American, no Japanese American, she was a Japanese, nurse, and an Indian student from Africa, uh, you know, background, uh, East Asian student, did their thesis on a battered woman, mm -hmm. Asian battered woman. Wow. And uh, then they, they took that experience and gave lectures to some of their classroom things, but they, that was part of their thesis. So students were very, uh, involved in the studies of social work. You know, they, mm -hmm. uh, so the, as I say, the thesis. And at that time, the uh, Korean uh, population were increasing. So we started to bring in as many Korean American students as we can okay. into the program. Did that ratio of 30, 30, uh, 30, 10 change? And I imagine if it did, you yeah. were a, you Over were a mentor. Over the years, it became 10. Oh. But the interesting thing is now I checked uh, that the Asian American population, student population at UCLA is huge. Mm -hmm. It's very, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, this is diversing a little bit. But when I checked uh, with UCLA admissions committee, uh, Jared, Jared Lavinia, he said that, I said, what happened? I said, uh, so I was in a, a function and someone told me last year they had only one African-American student. It, oh, I know. It was a student, a Latino student, who told a friend who's not a social worker, who conveyed that news to me that UCLA last year's class had only one year, one African-American. I was so upset. I said, what's going on with all the social action and happen? And I, so I called one of the faculty and they said, yes, uh, we're sorry, but it was, a, you know, it just happened. And so the next year, they, this year they have 10 students. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they increased, uh, mm -hmm. something happened. And, uh, but, so, my ears are always perked up That's <laughs> about those things. I'm sorry I had diversified a little bit, but. Well, could you tell us about your experience in mentoring students and also advocating for Asian American yeah. students? Well, we had a very active Asian group in the uh, 70s. And I know that uh, UCLA, USC didn't have any faculty that was helping the Asian students at that time. So we got together a few times. Our students met regularly every week and uh, came up with things they could contribute, uh, invite some lectures. Like they brought the first uh, a very prominent uh, uh, psychiatrist from Seattle, Washington. Uh, and he came over. His name was Lindy Lindbergh. Sata. He said, my father named him after Charles Lindbergh. And uh, he said, and he, he talked about the uh, mental health problems of Asian Americans and uh, Japanese and Asian. He, he covered Asian Americans in Seattle. So he, it was very good because we had very few um, psychiatrists mm -hmm. in, in uh, Asian psychiatrists uh, in Los Angeles. Um, 
uh, I know that knowing a little bit of the medical field, uh, when people went into medicine, unless they were going back to the Japanese American community, just using Japanese American, they, uh, they because when they were medical students, you know, uh, people, from what I understand, in growing up, for people in California and physicians who grew up in, they couldn't do exam of uh, other women because uh, unless they didn't want any Asian medical student touching them, and so there was a lot of prejudice at that time. So at that time, a lot of unless you were going back to the Japanese community, a lot of uh, early physicians went into institutional medicine, mm. radiology, pathology, where they don't have patient contact. It I was see. really a shame, but, uh, oh. and besides not having hospital privileges. Uh, so that's going way back, but wow. I'm di digressing. But uh, anyway, it, it was mm. a really difficult time. But thanks for sharing that, because I think a lot of people viewing the tape may not have a sense of that. Yeah. So you were departing from the time when we said, uh, you know, you were the Asian students at UCLA were meeting regularly. Yes. And, uh, oh, yes. And so, yes. So I, I met and I would invite them to my house. So mm -hmm. they became very close to me, mm -hmm. and and I would be there, uh, um, supporting them, but doing the meeting, and we would have function sometimes with SC, but towards the end we even had retreats at Big Bear with SC UCLA students. Uh, they, they, they bonded very closely, so I knew a lot of the SC graduates too uh, from that That's period. Crazy. Could and you speak to your efforts to, perhaps, and I would urge you not to be humble, to think about how this work that you did at UCLA influenced other schools of social work in the vicinity of Los Angeles? Yeah, I think at that time uh, um, there were only two schools of social work. Okay. SC and UCLA. Okay. And so I think uh, with all the affirmative action going on and being a public school too, mm -hmm. uh, SC started to really bring in a lot more Asian Americans into their program. And they, they Asian, a lot of the Quite a few of the SC graduates have become very prominent social workers in the community. Marlene Dong, David Kuroda, you know, they, they, they've really made good use of their education. Uh, we, we've had some from, like Bill Watanabe, Dick Wong, and uh, they have Royal Morales. Paul Chikahisa is our graduate, and he did things through U, uh, SSG, mm -hmm. and he became a, a so he's one, the only one of the early, early graduates that I think did a lot of things for the community uh, from UCLA. The, er, the ones who, were, who did things in the community were SC graduates <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, you know. I, I'm partial, but I'm also fair, I, you know, and I admire these people because they've done great work, like Marlene Dong Wong, she's gone, She's head of uh, field instruction, but she's right. gone and became an expert in the nation. You know, she's known nationally. Uh, so, so, as I say, some of these young people just became very prominent uh, social workers that we can be proud of. Mm -hmm. And that part, I feel glad that I, I knew them and I, you know, earlier years saw them grow and. Um, because they needed a lot of support. Oh, tell us about the support that you gave yeah. them. What you did know, they come to you for, and what yeah, do you feel like you gave they, them? When they had, they wanted to invite speakers, some prominent uh, Asians, uh, politicians, and things. They wanted to bring them mm -hmm. as uh, it's just extra lecturers to come in, and some of the thesis uh, um, area they should be working with, and all those things that. You know that was happening. I was like their mother hand. So I know I got a T-shirt that says UCLA mom because <laughs> uh, I was quotes their mother to them, and they they just felt very comfortable with me, and and uh, and I was very close to them, and mm -hmm. I still see some of them. 
you know. Tell us about the ones that you've had recent contact with. Does anybody come to mind? A recent contact? Mm -hmm. Well, Janet Hosa called in the Tanamachi. They're the real early ones. And now I'm going to the retirement uh, oh things my like goodness. Uh, Bibi Matsushige, you know, they're, they're all hitting 60, 65, you know. Jane, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's nice yes. to see. So I went to like Vivian's retirement and saw some of our other graduates from our school, the later ones in the 80s and 90s, they all working for the Department of Health and they came running up and it was a right, really nice reunion. So that's, that part is very gratifying for me. You know, it just touches me to see that they're still excited and they're, you know, helping uh, the Asian community and they tell me what they're doing and I, I love listening to students like that. That's great. So it, you know, it sort of paid off by being supportive and uh, not judgmental and that's why you use all your clinical skills. I mean that's one thing I have to say, our profession is a living profession. You know, you use it for your friends, but I use, try to use all what I learn in, when I interact with students, not to be judgmental, use of self, don't know your boundaries and things. But I, I let the boundaries sometimes move, you know, instead of faculty, I'm sure they got into a mother-child relationship <laughs> with me. I mean, that's what you call boundary issues, but uh, I was sure of the boundary issues, but you know, I, a lot of them I felt that once they graduate, they're going to be my colleague. Yes. You know, so, so it's okay if I was their mother and figure, uh, you, know, you know. So I enjoyed that. And um, so I, it was very supportive and, you know, encouraging, uh, you know, tell them I was behind them, whatever they did. And they knew that. Mm -hmm. and, and so they were kind of proud of what they did and they tell me what they, what they were writing about. And so there was a lot of sharing and giving, a lot of communication. And, and, and I have folders to stick. In fact, the, uh, last year I had to shred so many things that I had from the Asian caucus because I had all the notes oh from goodness. all they all had, we had, uh, we had a treasurer, president, uh, we always had president, we had officers, and they took responsibility, made sure we did all these things. So we were really a little organization. Uh, and, uh, and, and, the, and as I said, lots of them have really continued on with their profession. And, uh, so it's probably not a stretch to say that the work you did on the Asian caucus mentoring these students really was something they took into their practice yes. and were able to build on yes. in terms of agency building. Yes. And also as a field instructor, mm -hmm. I was also took, was very supportive of my minority students too because they really need a lot of uh, yeah. Tell help. Tell us about so. that. Tell us a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, because uh, some of them went recruiting with me, and uh, and they knew that I was supportive of the affirmative action uh, mm -hmm. program. So a lot of them um, were close, you know, would come to me and talk, and felt my office door was always open. And also, I, some of my 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 white students too. Like I see them. Uh, in Pasadena, they, they, in fact, last week I saw one of my students and she came up to me. She said, Jane, you remember me? And I said, of course, Elaine, <laughs> you know. Oh. Oh. And she told me that she's retired now. And uh, oh she, she said, I'm in the same role as you. Are you enjoying your grandchildren? She said, that's what I'm doing now. And, and so I get to see a lot of my students in the community and they always come in and I always tell them, at my age, I'm in the 80s now, refresh me. And they like that instead of saying, and, and, and they say, oh, you remember I used to go around with Colleen or David or someone they mentioned. I said, oh, you were in a class in the 80s. That's right. And oh my it was somebody who's in the 70s, they say, you remember when 
uh, we gave Connery a bad time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because the minority students were really strong in the 70s. Uh -huh. they, uh, they, they, they would speak their piece and all this. And so I know when I went home one time, my father told me, hey, Jane, your language has deteriorated. And he said, you remember shut up was a bad word? I said, oh, yes. But I said, you know, you cannot say hold of Matilda. If you want to get your parka, you got to hit them with the hard words, you know. And so my, even my father noticed my, my wording had changed. But, but that time we needed to be strong. And, uh, you know, being kind and nice was not the thing to be, to be very strong. Mm -hmm. So speaking of being strong, I remember when you were at UCLA, you were a strong advocate on the admissions committee for interviewing. Now, I know that various schools of social work have fallen away from their practice and sometimes have come back to it. So can you speak to oh, yeah. the value of interviewing applicants? Yes. The interview is, uh, I also knew that the Greenpeace, too, mm -hmm. we needed mm -hmm. some of those who had really, uh, I think it's important that you, when someone is just not, just want to get a degree and not ready, somehow there are three of us that used to interview together. And uh, so we rejected some students that were not really ready for the field, just wanted a master's degree. And we were mm -hmm. very closely, because I think basically social workers have to be giving sensitive, uh, have good values, ethics, and all this. And I'll tell you, for me, as a fieldwork consultant, mm -hmm. the most difficult job was to counsel out students. Tell us about that. And because we used to give grades, A, B, C, in the A, Bs. And you know, I, I know I had a minority student who was so angry at me because I gave her a B. But she was a B student. She said, I went to Stanford. I mean, I want to go to get my PhD. Why do you give? But I said, I'm sorry. But you know, you did not show the kind, your commitment. You did was very sloppy with your you know, things. And I have to grade you 16 credit hours. And you were a B student. And so I had to deal with that thing, even if it mm -hmm. was a minority student. But I was strong. And if it's. I had to count a lot, maybe, but three Asian students wow. out of the program. And that was very difficult. Sure. But, because we try to be careful with what we admit, but sometimes they, you know, they do a good interview and, you know, they know what, what to do. <laughs> and so, but I did have to count a lot the student. Uh, three Asian students. It was very hard, but it, our profession mm -hmm. needs people that we can be proud they're going to be social workers. And I think my worst nightmare was when I was sued. Oh. I was sued for $9 million by a social work student that we counseled out. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that I documented everything. I did not do kicking out. It was in conjunction with my field instructor. Mm -hmm. He was able to document his concerns. And I, with my all concerns, put it together and then consulting with my chief <laughs> at that time, Katie, and then we counseled out the student. And uh, then he, he was so upset that he sued us. He sued the dean, myself, and somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the thing is, we know we have legal coverage. But my husband being in medicine, people those days were suing doctors like crazy. Sure. So I went through an emotional period like, I thought, God, I'm losing all, you know, what we worked for because we have to pay for this lawsuit because my children are ready for college. I mean, it was really a stressful time wow. for me because 
like anything else, insurance, you know that you can they'll cover so much, then after that, uh, we don't know what. And so uh, the university legal department came to talk to us and all that. But, but, but deep inside, I knew that I did right. Mm -hmm. This guy did not belong in the profession, and it's Phil and the agency, the whole agency said, we got to get the student out, doesn't belong in the profession. So we, we did get him out. Then he realized that he had no case. So he asked the university, he asked the dean and myself if, he, if we could pay for his, uh, if the university would cover his uh, attorney's fee. And so we played hardball and we said, no, we can counter sue you for the harassment you caused us. <laughs> and uh, so he dropped everything. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that, Jane. But I think you know, that but as a fieldwork consultant, important. that's part of your job. I mean, you want to graduate students who you're going to know they're going to be good professional. I'm, I'm dedicated to that. I don't think we should bring people in the field that is not made for the field. And but then I had heard that he came back and tried to steal some things the computers somehow got into our office and so he was not he was not to be a social worker mm -hmm. so just to add a little bit extra to what had happened oh my goodness but 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 i would recommend that all field instructors be honest and if people don't belong in the field they do not belong in the field that's yeah. one of my ethics is that we do not need people that don't belong to help because we we're helping people you know and speaking of your work in field education you had a philosophy about placing students yeah. in field work placing them in something that they were unfamiliar with so they could grow i remember i learned yes. that from you and there were some other um, very specific ideas you had about placing students and also placing asian american students mm -hmm. could you tell us about that yes well some of it was random, but if they had certain interests, uh, you know, I considered that mm -hmm. and, and try to place. And then if you place them with they have a mission to do things, then they will fulfill it. And so um, I know I had one student who was, you know, because she was in the affirmative action, she was kind of angry in, mm -hmm. inside. And we, if, if this was Warren Brown, we would have asked her to go see a psychiatrist. You know, I went to a school <laughs> where everybody had a psychiatrist because uh -huh. we all have issues. Oh. I mean, nobody comes to the field without issues. And so Warren Brown was so good about this. So we all had a joke about psychiatrists. And the, the department, this is depressing, but the department that I worked for at University of uh, Washington University, most everyone was had some psychiatrists to work with their issues, so the instrument would n know you would be because mm -hmm. you use yourself as a lot to the sound board, mm -hmm. so your instrument must be fine tuned once in a while, and 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 I, I, that's how I feel, and I think the fine tune you do, you be you grow yourself too. I mean, and I really think social work is a wonderful profession because that's why I was a good recruiter. They said, wow, oh, you make it so exciting you know, when I talked to them because I said, you know, you can carry your skills for the rest of your life and you can use it for your relationships, you know, what you, because you use yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. I know I have used it for my family, my grandchildren, my husband, my friends, you know, you can, you know how to listen, you know how to filter things, you know, you learn all of this thing mm -hmm. as a social worker. And that's why I call it the profession of living. That's why I love social work. I always loved the profession of social work. And uh, so, you know, 
I'm proud to be a social worker when people ask me, and what I did, I tell them I'm a social worker because it's a really uh, an honorable profession, caring, sensitive, and giving to. And, uh, That's wonderful, Jan. I'm wondering if we might take a small break because we probably should look at our notes and see if we oh. missed anything that we want to yeah, explain. Yeah. We covered a lot of material and here we are back again and we thought we might pick up where we left off and say how your students have been such a great reflection of your work and how it really has brought your work back home because some of them have gone on not only for an MSW but also for a PhD and some of them are actually executive directors and faculty members. So could you expand on that a little bit more? Yes. Some of our graduates uh, have really become CEOs of major uh, agencies like the Little Tokyo Service Center. I think it's, they also build a big uh, apartment, which they have their office on the first floor, but it's about four or five stories for uh, minority uh, low-income housing in Little Tokyo. It's a huge organization and Bill has able run have lots of funding and as I showed you a picture uh, for Social Work Week last week uh, in March I went and talked and I was surprised to find that our graduate of course is the uh, head of the department but she also has 15 or 16 social workers, and six of them are MSW, seven, maybe half or more are MSW or trainees, and I was so happy to see them do that. But then we have great people like Dick Wong, who wrote the, the um, funding for a lot of agency and was ended up being a CEO of Assistance League, which is a family service agency. And he also uh, had a, a, a West Side agency. And that all came about from a student thesis work. And, uh, and also a lot of our students have become leaders in, in the area of mental health. And when I went to one of the retirement, I saw lots of gra our graduates, uh, especially Asians and Latinos uh, who are now part of the um, administrative and they have all risen to high uh, positions. I mean, they went in as regular workers in the 80s and 90s and 80s and they really are now uh, slowly retiring and they were uh, held very uh, prominent positions. And, uh, and I also would like to mention that some of our students went on to get their PhDs and now funding um, a lot of uh, 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 students and hopefully they can carry the tradition of going for uh, mental health. I also want to mention one other thing that was so men was very good for my professional very early in the uh, uh, 60s. 50s was I served on the Commission of uh, Council of Social Work Education oh, tell for us about that. three years. Uh, at that time, it was uh, social action time, uh, and I worked and met a lot of the deans and faculty of the various schools who were on the admissions, uh, who were on the uh, committee for accreditation. And so I was able to, I always, felt I did a lot of input about putting minority curriculum and the need for students into uh, the meetings. And uh, though that was a meaningful time, and I was able to meet a lot of the prominent social workers, deans and people who were open to looking at things, and hopefully some of my promoting these things had gotten to their schools also. So that was my... Uh, payoff for being on the admissions uh, on the accreditation committee for three years and we met three times a year and that was a very valuable experience really working with high-level social workers. I'm so glad you said that because sometimes people when they take those assignments they don't see the long-term benefit. Yes. It sounds like you really laid a lot of good groundwork. Yes, because there were a lot of deans on the committee yeah. and chairperson for BSWs too. And uh, so, I mean, I thought that was, was in the 
uh, uh, 70s, but it really was a very good uh, experience for me. It was a special experience meeting Brilliant, the leaders of the profession. Wow. And Jane, off, off uh, camera, you were saying that students have really changed over the years, from the 70s to the 80s to yes. the 90s. Could you say a little bit about that? Okay. I think when, we, when I first started UCL, that the students were, I guess it was a time, so students were very active and there's so many mm -hmm. things they wanted to do. But as the years went by, I think like in the 80s, uh, they uh, bonded together, but they weren't as social work minded. I think some of the, um, and things were, I mean, the, age, the minorities were getting recognition. And um, uh, so it, uh, it, it, but the students who came in were good students. They were active, but they didn't have that spunk, you know, that the call for social action. And so uh, gradually, I think the type of students came in change. But one thing I would like to add that recently I heard that there's nine schools of social work in Southern California. My concern is that are we mass producing students? I mean, I've been retired now for some, but uh, before, uh, they're going to be increasing it to 15 schools of social work in Southern California. I mean, are we going too far? I mean, I, I, these are my concerns because mm -hmm. I, I felt that we were meeting the needs of the community, but the proliferation of so many degree programs. Uh, uh, because I remember being on the, when I was on the Council of Social Work Education, the BSWs came in. Uh, more prominently, and but now it's MSW that's growing. How many falls yes. I can't say, but uh, yes. I'm concerned. And also, another thing is that I think that uh, the social I have not uh, been engaged in social work education the past uh, ten years already uh, since my retirement. But I'm wondering if they're really. Uh, looking at issues of today because our society is really changing and people are changing and a uh, thing of domestic violence. Okay, uh, give us some, some examples of domestic yeah, violence. Yeah. What else? We need some of that in the curriculum and mm -hmm. as uh, Cardinal Maloney said during the sexual abuse thing that's happening mm -hmm. in California, I never learned this at social work school. I read that mm -hmm. and said, yeah, maybe the curriculum didn't cover those uh, sexual abuses. How do you deal with that? How do you sell support? I mean, it just occurred to me. I was okay, even as my retired, being a retired person, I mean, that lighted up social work education. I said, okay, he went to a Catholic university. Correct. Uh, he went to a Catholic university. I remember reading about that. So I said, but you know, that's food for thought. And then a lot of one out of so many marriages are uh, ending up in divorce. You know, a, a student's been uh, looked, is that looked into the curriculum about the divorces, what happened to children, mm -hmm. uh, and the conciliation? I know that uh, we have some prominent people like David Kuroda, who was such, who, who's mm -hmm. a conciliator, but if the students if you have a field placement, you might get that experience, but is that kind of curriculum covered in uh, social work education? I mean, uh, as I said, our life is changing, so many divorces, you have blended families. I mean, uh, you know, some of them can be successful. And so are we including these things into the current curriculum to be on top of what's happening? I felt that we, when I was in social work practice, everything was trying to keep up with what, with the changes of the profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember from the time, as I say, when uh, Dr. King said, I have a dream, and lots of things did come true from that dream. We have a, a president, who, you know, is African American. And so when, we re when I reflect through life, you know, we're, life changes. And I hope 
my profession, social work, moves along with the changes as we go along because we are a wonderful profession. Oh my goodness, Jane, you just took it full circle. So uh, in this part that we came back on, we, we talked about some of your students really reflecting your work and their tremendous success in the community and moving on into teaching. And then we looked back at how you were wondering if various uh, aspects of current life were being uh, folded into the new uh, curriculums that are supervised by the Council on Social Work Education. And now you've taken it full circle in saying that even as a retired person, you wonder, you know, you hope our profession is growing in the way that life always presents us challenges. So we're so honored to have this interview with you today. And we know that it'll be housed at the uh, Social Welfare Archives and uh, it'll be a wonderful opportunity for future students to learn about you and your work and your work with not only Asian American students but all social work students. So we thank you for sharing your background yeah. and how you've grown over time. Thank you, it really was a pleasure. I, I, I said I was very anxious about this moment but I actually enjoyed it. Thank you very <laughs> much, Colleen. <laughs> You're welcome, Jane. And thank you to David Kuroda for all his assistance and preparation. Yeah, for the thank you, today. David. <laughs>